So I won't talk too much about this because you're here for Nigel's talk, um, but this webinar is part of our winter webinar series for a project called Get the Marches Buzzing. And I work on that project and so does Kate Jones. You can see her there. Um, she's the conservation officer on the project. And just in a nutshell, um, Get the Marches Buzzing is a restoration project. and We're restoring 61 hectares of wildfire rich habitat along Bug Life's Bee Lines Network in Shropshire and North Herefordshire. Our funders are on the screen and we just wanted to point them out. Thank you. Um, but if you'd like to know more about our project, I'll put a link in the chat to um, the web page and feel free to give drop me an email um, if you want to know more. And I just want to do a quick little plug. Um, we have another webinar that's coming up on Thursday, the 22nd of February um, with Dr. Erica McAllister. She's going to be talking all about flies as pollinators. So if you are interested in this, I will include the link in um, the follow-up email. Okay, so thank you for joining us this evening and welcome to this Bug Life webinar. I am delighted to introduce our speaker today, who is um, Nigel Jones. He is an incredible entomologist and very active within the Shropshire Invertebrate Group. He will be talking us through uh, the special pollinators and invertebrates found in Shropshire and North Herefordshire. And I had a sneak preview of his talk on Tuesday. I can confirm it is very good. So I'm very excited to hear the rest of it. So I'll now let Nigel share his screen and enjoy everyone. Right. So can I just check that that is sharing? Oh, I can't see it. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I, okay. I didn't oh, actually want sorry. to Sorry, yeah. Okay, we'll try again. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, I did the wrong thing, didn't I? Um, Right. Oh. Now, is that looking better? I can see the screen. If yeah. you... I'm going to go to slideshow now. And how's that? Yep, yeah, I can see it. Ooh, that's a relief. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, I'm Nigel Jones. I've lived in the Shropshire area since uh, 1986, and all that and all that time I've been interested in in insects, particularly flies, and then uh, latterly in the last sort of 20 years in um, bees and wasps and various other insects as well. But flies is my real uh, first choice of insects to study, followed closely by bees and wasps. So today, uh, I'm getting, this is this talk's aimed at sort of people just uh, getting into um, pollinators and insects in the areas. So I've included a few quite common things that people can look out for and some of the specialities which people would have to try really hard to try and find. Uh, so hopefully it'll make for an interesting talk for you. Okay, um, I'm gonna start as it's nearly the end of January now um, with a bee that uh, all being well is usually out early in March. And if we get quite a warm, um, February with a little bit of sunshine. These have been known in, in, the, in the marches area to come out as early as the sort of last week of February. So um, hopefully that'll cheer everybody up. There's a prospect of bees on the wing, uh, wild bees on the wing within sort of five to six weeks time. Certainly it uh, cheers me up after a long, cold and damp winter. So this is the hairy footed flower bee. And uh, the reason I've chosen this to start the talk with is that you can get this in gardens, uh, woodlands, uh, anywhere really where you get uh, plants like forget-me-nots, uh, longwort, comfrey, that type of thing, and uh, suitable nesting areas. And nesting areas are generally sort of vertical banks of um, loose soil where the um, female excavates nests and, and provisions a nest with pollen and puts an egg into the, uh, into the burrow with the pollen seals it to make a, a sort of a, a cell uh, and the larvae hatch inside that term um, burrow and they consume the pollen that's been provisioned by the female and then they lay up until this time of year when um, they'll, 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 they will have pupated sometime probably in the, in the autumn or summer and then they'll emerge, uh, a new, the new generation will emerge as I've said coming up in sort of February, March time. So that's, that's the life history for the vast majority of wild um, bees in Britain, the social um, bees, the bumblebees, 
and the honeybees, which where you get sort of hundreds or thousands of individuals in a nest, are uh, only about 20, I think it's about 25, 26 species in total. The other, um, no, I've forgotten the number, but it's uh, yeah, about 250 other species are all solitary species. So why is it called the hairy-footed um, flower bee? Well, the male, as you can see here, um, these long hairs on the middle foot, and it's named for those long hairs on that middle foot. And uh, we'll see in a little while why it's got those long hairs there. Now, the males, are, they, uh, said they come, out for, they, they come out first in sort of late um, February, probably more, more likely in most years, so sort of early to mid-March time. And as you saw, I'll just flip back to the slides to show, it's a sort of brownish uh, looking bee with a creamy white face. The female, by contrast, and she'll emerge about a week to two weeks after the first males have come out, uh, is all black with um, orange hairs on the hind tibia. And that makes this a really distinctive um, bee around the garden. So if you have got it in the garden, you're out and about and you see something like this, buzzing around flowers, long tongue stuck out in front of it, all black, orange tibia, it's almost certainly going to be hairy-footed flower bees, and uh, you'll know the year is off, uh, the, you know, the bee-watching year is off. And um, interestingly, as soon as females appear in a patch of flowers, you'll find a male will soon be there, and possibly more than one male. In this photo here, you can see there's a male actually on the um, female, here on the right, so she's landed to, so she's freshly emerged from her burrow. Uh, she's she's out to try and find, you know, to get some nectar and uh, uh, to fuel up, ready for all the work she's got to do in um, building nests and provisioning them. And the males, probably for the last week or so, have just been uh, patrolling around these flowers, buzzing around really quickly. Oops, I'm not that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and waiting for the first females to come out. And the reason for that is that um, the females have got a lot of work to do. And this ensures that they don't have to spend any time in fancy courtship rituals or looking for, for, for males. The males are already out. They're, um, they're, 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 they're looking for females to mate with. And it all happens very quickly. There's no, uh, there's no fancy courtship. It basically seems to amount to the female landing in an area with flowers, the male seeing them grabbing them, and then they stroke those middle legs with the long hairs uh, over the antenna of the female. Um, nobody's really sure precisely what's happening in that, whether they're passing some kind of um, uh, pheromones across each other or it's some kind of chemo receptors, and you know, they're physically able to feel some kind of vibrations which send a message, is not really sure, but it's something to do with, uh, you know, getting the, mate, the, 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 the mating uh, going, that whole thing of stroking that, that middle leg over the uh, female antenna. So that's one to look out for, uh, and hopefully we'll be seeing that in the next five to six weeks. Looking, uh, what, so that's, that's one you can see fairly easily, uh, even in urban areas and parks and gardens and cemeteries, uh, it, it's, it's usually about. Uh, also, a good thing to, to listen out for is it's quite high pitched whiny buzz it makes as it flies around so that's all up that's actually quite useful for telling it apart from anything else that might be flying at the time but um there are lots of other mining bee species and an awful lot of them do come out um in pretty short order uh, after the first bees have emerged some other species will um will emerge and uh, they're often uh well, they're, they will all be mining bees. And um, one to look out for very early in the year, again, coming out as early as the, the middle of February, but not so much found in gardens. Uh, the way to find it is sort of when you're walk, walking in areas uh, and you might see some sort of silty, sandy ground, not so much sandy, but uh, quite loose, friable soil. And if you can see here, these little mounds of soil and some, there's a hole there. Uh, and these are like little holes in. And this is where um, another species has emerged out of the ground. Basically, it's pushed the soil up that the female last year had, bur um, had buried its uh, offspring um, you know, beneath, beneath the uh, soil surface. In. And if you look carefully, you'll probably see this rather nondescript little bee. And this is a male mining bee in the um, genus Andrina. 
and these you'll see quite a lot of in the spring, various andrean species. And this is this is generally in the marches. This is the first one you will see uh, out and about in the wider countryside. It takes a bit more spotting because it's not as showy and, uh, it, and it doesn't sort of patrol around flowers at ground level. It actually feeds on pollen, so uh, it's harder to spot because it's up in the trees feeding on, uh, sorry, I said pollen. It feeds on, the female gathers um, willow pollen. And you generally get the males and the females both nectaring on, on willow. So things like goat willow particularly. So again, the males are out um, a week, probably, uh, maybe up to two weeks, but certainly a, 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 a good few days before any females emerge. And uh, if you get there at just as the first females are beginning to emerge, you can probably you, you can often see these the, the males clustering around uh, burrow entrances, and they're able to sense somehow. And you see in this one, this male here has got his antenna sticking down into the into the burrow entrance, and this male's shoving its sort of half its body down inside there. And they uh, and the male will actually it will sense that the females coming out, and they will dig down. Uh, to liberate the, you know, to help liberate the female from um, from the chamber beneath, uh, basically, so they can be first to first in and, and get to mate with the female. Now, the female is an altogether more showy insect, and uh, it's quite, it's, it's more sort of robust than the male, uh, partly because it's got these long hairs on it. It's lovely sort of uh, tawny, or uh, boxy, tawny orange coloured hairs on the thorax there, and then uh, again all black so you might confuse it with the previous bee the hairy footed mining bee but this occurs in very different situations uh <clears throat> and you don't get it with the male flying around flowers so that that uh, gives you a hint it's not that species uh so if you see this all black orange across the middle of the uh the thorax and orange on the um the hind leg you've probably got andrina clarkella or clark's mining bee as I say, she's a specialist pollen collector, uh, more or less exclusively collects from um, wi uh, willow pollen, uh, particularly from uh, goat willow and sallow. So now moving on to another species. And about just, uh, it's, it, it's a, it's, it, this isn't a bee, although it uh, tries to look like a bee. This is a fly. And I expect quite a few of you have come across this. This is the, uh, the bee fly, a species known as the dark-edged bee fly. In the marches, this is by far the commonest of the bee fly species. And you can find this virtually anywhere, really, anywhere where there are nesting uh, mining bees. There's generally Andrina mining bees that these go after. And these uh, not only look like bees, but they also um, uh, attack bees in their nests. So what happens with these is that the, uh, the bees uh, the bees larvae uh, get introduced into the nest of the bees by the uh, the fly, and I'll show you how that's done in a second. And then the larvae uh, they wait until the lar the, the, the this is the bee lar sorry the fly larvae wait until the bee larvae is more or less fully developed, feeding on the pollen that the female bees laid up, and then the fly's larvae hatches. And then it uh, rather gruesomely it attacks and eats the uh, the bee larvae. So these these flies are, are totally dependent on bees uh, to survive. So it's called the dark edge bee fly. This one or Bombilius major because of this night this neat dark thick dark edge to the wing there. So that's an easy way to tell it apart from a second species which we'll see in a moment. First of all. Just going to show you a video. And here's a female bee fly. And uh, you'll see that it's sort of vibrating the tip of its abdomen on the ground. And what it's doing is it's picking up bits of grit uh, and sort of sandy soil. And uh, it uses those bits of grit that it picks up to, uh, to glue to its, it sort of attaches them to its eggs. And then, and this is another species, but uh, both species do this. This is the dotted wing bee fly, which is a much scarcer species uh, in, in the marches. It's only 
in, until probably the last five or six years, this was, this was more or less unknown in the marshes. Uh, but with pro probably with the effects of climate change and a warming climate throughout uh, Britain, this has started to spread from the south of England and it's turning up quite regularly now in Shropshire. It's bigger than the common dark edge, dark edge or dark edge bee fly, uh, and has these rather than the dark edge, it has these spots on the wings. And as you can see, you see them from behind. It's got a very dark end to the uh, abdomen. It's quite a bit bigger as well than the uh, common species. So that's a good one to keep an eye out for. And this again will also occur in people's gardens. Uh, I've had people sending me photos asking what this is and. Uh, from Bridge North and Ludlow, so it's certainly in the south of the county. It hasn't yet reached, uh, as far as I know, the sort of more northern parts of Shropshire. So it's probably occurs quite widely throughout Herefordshire, would be my guess now. And the sort of northern edge of the range of the species seems to be somewhere in the southern half of Shropshire at the moment. Anyway, so you'll often see these bees hovering uh, in the vicinity of mining bees' nests. And they seem to be sort of, they'll be hovering and then they'll suddenly jerk forward and back. Uh, and what they're doing then at, at the same time, is all too quick to see, but you can sort of make out this jerking motion that they make as they're hovering near the nest of um, Andrina mining bees. They're actually flicking the eggs uh, of uh, that, that will hatch into the young larvae of the, of the bee fly. They're flicking them to go and get them as close as they can to the entrances of bees nests and the reason for that is that they're, they're pretty flimsy things these flies you would have seen them just i'll just remind you uh what a you know they're very flimsy little you know narrow legs and they're quite a small insect so they don't really want to get um caught in or around the nest of the bee or they'll be they'll be getting given pretty short shrift by the bees and possibly sort of getting badly injured or killed so they stay up in the air flicking their eggs uh their, their grit laden eggs so the grit that they stick to the eggs uh basically gives them a bit of weight so it's easier for the bee the fly to flick them towards the nest entrance and uh the eggs hatch pretty quickly and they get a, a stage called a, a, a larvae called the planidial la, uh, larvae. And it's actually a leg, uh, it's, it's a larvae that has small legs on it. And this is unusual for flies because fly, fly you know, larvae, as many of you know, they're typically they're maggots, no legs at all. So these have legs in the first stage and that enables them if they're close enough, uh, if the egg is landed close enough to the entrance of a mining bee, that enables them to, um, to crawl into the nest and sort of seek, secret, secret itself away and await uh, the sort of growth of the bee larvae so that once it's more or less fully grown, it can then attack the larvae and uh, feed upon it and then develop as an, an adult fly for next year. So gruesome life history, but uh, I think you will agree, extremely fascinating. Uh, and one of the reasons that the uh, bees are so interesting is not only their own life histories uh it's, it's, it's the sort of the, the variety of things that they that, that depend on them and they support so there's a lot of um, diversity of insect life associated with with bees so on to another uh bee which is interesting because it um didn't occur in shropshire until about uh, a dozen years ago uh and in this photo my um friend and a uh, bee-loving acquaintance, Ian Cheeseborough. I'm sure uh, anybody from the Marches area will have come across Ian if you've been interested in bees. He's the local bee guru. Um, he's staring in astonishment at this mound of sand that's in a old um, disused sand quarry about six or seven miles outside Shrewsbury. And the reason for that is that Ian and I have just uh, found a bee here which really, as far as we knew, had absolutely no business being there. But what was interesting was there were 30 or 40 nests uh, of this bee on this little mound of uh, sand there. And it's this thing, the early Kalites. And then and now until 2011, this had never been seen in the Marches area, as far as we knew. It was really only known in Britain from a few sites on the coast of uh, mid and north Wales and the sand dunes north of Liverpool around Formby. And that was basically the extent of the entire British population. It was a real rarity. 
And then just out of the blue, they started turning up inland uh, across parts of um, England, uh, including Shropshire, in about 2011. Uh, and we don't really know how that happened. But it does seem that there, um, some of the inland populations have a different... Um, I don't know how to describe this, but they've been the sort of molecular basis of them. Uh, the DNA has been um, looked into, and they seem to be different from the coastal ones. So they're not necessarily ones from the you know that that Welsh coast that have expanded across the area. They come from somewhere where we don't really know what where. Anyway, interestingly, so this is the female. Uh, she's pretty uh, in, indistinctive, apart from the fact that she's quite large. She's out early in the year. You'll only find it in sort of sandy areas. And <clears throat> probably it's around about the size of a honeybee, which is quite big for a honeybee. And it's quite chunky by comparison. So in some ways it looks a bit bigger than, than I, um, I said mining bee did. I mean, it's quite, big, it's quite big for a mining bee. It's a bit bigger than a honeybee or about, you know, about the same length, but more chunky. Now, by um, last year, that quarry, having started from probably a couple of hundred nests at best, I mean, Ian and I, Ian and I were able to find about about thirty on that first occasion that we found them there. And within a dozen years, there are literally thousands and thousands. I'm just going to show you a video now, which shows males that have emerged in that quarry and uh, are flying around rapidly over the ground, basically waiting for females to emerge. So look at that. This is just a small area of that quarry, and the, it was like this all the way around this quarry. There were must have been tens of thousands of males of this bee. So I'm just leaving that to play, and I'll finish in a bit. So I hope that gives you an idea of how rapidly. Um, the population was able to grow on that particular site. And so um, once uh, uh, those, those, the females of the vernal calites, so I call it the vernal calites, it's actually called the, uh, also called the early calites, I've given it, to, you know, I called it the, yeah, the early calites or the vernal. So we'll call it the early, I've mistyped it there. Uh, once some females start to emerge, it's the same old story. So in there, there's probably a female just coming out. These are all males with white hairs on their face. And they're going nuts because they can sense there's a female coming out. And what generally will happen, just finish, let this video finish. What generally will happen, once a female appears near the surface, she'll probably get dragged out by the males, uh, much as the Clark's mining bee did. Um, a whole bunch of males will uh, pounce on a female and they'll be frantically trying to uh, be the one that gets to mate. So somewhere in there is, is a female. I can't actually make uh, a female out at all in there, but there are five males there uh, all mating away and they actually end up trying to mate with each other, the males, because the sort of, I suppose, the pheromones of the of the, uh, the female, it's uh, waiting to for the emit to let males know it uh, it's, hadn't been mating with probably get on to the male and they and they and they sort of get so excited they're not trying to mate with each other and sometimes you'll get little um balls of uh, males perhaps with a female in the middle and they'll be, if there's a slope they'll see this ball of bee bouncing down a slope because uh, there's so many males trying to mate but it's a usual story of um you know the, the females have got a huge amount of work to do they've got to dig nests they've got to um go and collect pollen and they'll probably uh, and then they, um, they'll create a, a ball of pollen lay an egg on it seal a cell and they'll probably do that uh, 20 to 30 35 times so it's a huge amount of work for a small insect to do and these burrows can go quite deep as well you know sort of to up to say uh, 150 uh, through, or even 300 mil depending on on the species deep into the ground so lots of excavation going on so the reason for these males um, emerging so early compared to the females is so that the females can be instantly mated with and they can get on with this uh, huge task they've got to do. So sorry, I should have mentioned, um, this is another species 
Cleates, same sort of life history as the early um, Cleates. But this is one you get in upland areas on heather. Uh, so this is quite widespread on the Long Min, the Stiper Stones, uh, probably on the Clee Hills, anywhere really where you'll get quite a bit of heather uh, and particularly in more sort of upland areas. This is quite a common species. But in more lowland areas, you probably you tend not to see this because um, it, it, it um, prefers upland areas. So uh, a quick look now at a couple of species that the um, Get the Marches Buzzing project is particularly targeting. Uh, one is the dingy skipper on, on the right and then the uh, bilberry mining bee. Now the dingy skipper, um, this is a species that's, oops, I don't know what happened there. I'll just go back. It's a sort of rather nondescript, um, dull looking little um, butterfly. This is uh, this is one that's been photographed uh, in, in Shropshire somewhere. And they tend to, uh, it's, it's a species that's been much in decline and uh, tends to occur in areas with quite sort of sparsely vegetated ground. And uh, it's usually where there's an abundance of bird's foot trefoil, which is the food plant of the larvae of this. And uh, in Shropshire, there really is very few um, records for or sites for it. Uh, and the same, I think in Herefordshire, it's even scarcer. So I'm just going to show you uh, a map of these. These are sites that's been recorded across Herefordshire and uh, Shropshire. So you'll see Herefordshire, really, there's only this one record here and then one just outside the area, uh, somewhere in the Black Mountains area, I think. Not sure. And then there are some in old quarries up around Oswestry, Street and then over in the Telford area. And that's sort of, I'm not sure what these other three in the middle are, but that's more or less it. So very uh, few sites in the area. And uh, interestingly, it often occurs in old quarries uh, and brownfield sites. And those are the classic places to find that species. So one to keep an eye out for. Uh, in, in the spring, it would be very useful for people if they're in there, if they can send records in of these, it would be good to know if we've got any more uh, sites for that species. And now the bilberry bumblebee. Now this is a bumblebee very much of upland areas, um, as the name implies, it likes bilberry. It feeds on uh, bilberry and coluna, so heather. Um, and this is a uh, yeah, this is a female, I think. Yeah, because the male would have sort of pale hair on the face. It's uh, superficially might be mistaken at first sight in the field for the red-tailed bumblebee. I just note uh, the extent of the orangey red tail. It's virtually the whole of the abdomen. There's only a small section of the abdomen that's not red. And also the fact that, that on the thorax at the front, there's a sort of pale band and another one over the um, the back of the thorax. If you compare that with the red, the red tail bumblebee, which a lot of people will be familiar with, which is all black with a red tail, um, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. And the reason I'm telling you that is if you're out in upland areas, uh, again, we're uh, always keen to get uh, any records people can get of the bilberry bumblebee. Uh, I'd like to reassure you that it's reasonably easy to tell these apart, um, even from a distance. Uh, you, you can quickly write off uh, a potential bilberry bumblebee if it's, if, if it's got a limited amount of uh, reddish orange on the, uh, on the abdomen. But more importantly, if it lacks any pale coloured hairs on the thorax, if it's basically all black with a bit of red at the end, it's going to be the red tail bumblebee. If it's got some white on the thorax and lots of, um, sort of orangey red colouring on the, on the abdomen, then suspect a bilberry bumblebee and take a good look at it and uh, try and get a photograph. Or if you're confident and you know that's what it is, um, make a record of it. And the reason I, we're asking you to make records is that uh, that's the distribution of it in the marches, as far as I know. Um, these were this this is this is records taken again for the last 10, 10 years at most um, off the National Biodiversity Networks Atlas. And basically, we have three uh, centres of population. The two major ones are the Stiper Stones and the Long Mind. And then uh, the, the 
the bee, the bilberry bumblebee has been recorded from the clear hills, but whenever I've looked for it there, I've never found any myself. So there doesn't seem to be well established there. Uh, so one to look out for. And I think some of the work that uh, the uh, Keep the Marches Buzzing project is doing should help um, to plug what's known as a hunger gap for this species. Uh, it's in decline probably largely because of um, climate change, but perhaps making areas too warm for it where it's thrived in the past. It's very much old adapted species. Um, and between bilberry and uh, the heather flowering seasons, there's quite a long gap. So uh, some of the sort of meadow creation and uh, just encouraging more sort of wildflowers in the landscape should help this bee to survive uh, in, in the marches. So uh, also in those sort of upland areas, uh, but associated with another common plant, tormentil, is this thing, the tormentil mining bee. Uh, again, uh, likes, it, it, it very much occurs in more, more upland areas than lowland areas. And there's another species that seems to have been going into a sharp decline uh, in the marches. I only know of records from the area in the Clun Forest around uh, Lower Short Ditch and uh, Ross Fiddle, so quite high up uh, in the Clun Forest on sort of uh, uh, on, on uh, fairly bleak heathy areas. But interestingly, uh, this year, um, Kevin McGee, uh, uh, an entomologist from the north of Worcestershire, found these at Catherton Common uh, on the Clee Hills. And what's even more exciting, and it's exciting enough finding these tormentil mining bees, and before I move on to the real excitement, uh, they're quite difficult to identify, as are a lot of the mining bees. But this one very helpfully has uh, its uh, mandibles have three teeth. I'm just pointing those. Hopefully, my cursors are showing on your screen, my cursor, and you can see these three teeth. Uh, so, if you want to be absolutely certain you've got this species, I would need to do this because I hardly ever see it. So, I'm not familiar enough to know when I see it that, oh, yes, that's a tormentil mining bee. Uh, you have to get it sort of in a tube and uh, press it up against the surface. In this case, what we've done is we've got some cling film across the top of a uh, tube with some uh, sponge pushing up from beneath and uh, that sort of aggravates the bee and she opens her jaws in a threat posture and it means you can quickly uh, with a hand lens see these uh, three pronged um, mandibles and you've got your ID there so not as easy to identify as a bilberry uh, mining bee but believe me compared to identifying some other species of andrina bee this is a this is quite a nifty easy one that can be done in the field so the excitement is that uh, Kevin, who found that species and photographed the tormentil mining bee at, um, on the Clear Hills at, uh, in, uh, on the edge of Catherton Common, also found this, the tormentil nomad bee. And this is a, um, a cuckoo. And there are lots of different uh, nomad cuckoos, but this is one of the real rarities. Um, and I'll just show you a map. So on that map there, the darker the, um, the little squares on the map, the darker green, the more recent the, um, the records are. And you can see that really the main population is, is concentrated in Cornwall uh, with a few very scattered more recent records from around the country. And the record for Shropshire is, sits in a great area of, uh, with no records at all. Um, you know, from as far back as 30 years. So it's really, exci it's really exciting to find this species uh, in Shropshire. So I would say keep an eye out for it, but uh, it's it's such a difficult thing to find that uh, you'll probably not much point in you know, making special expeditions to find it. Now the cuckoo bees in the genus Namada uh, include that real rarity, but there are lots of other uh, really quite common ones. and. For the most part, they're all um, cuckoos uh, on species of mining bee in the genus Andrina. And uh, when I say cuckoos, what I mean is they, they basically, they hang around the nests of mining bees in the genus Andrina. And a little like the bee fly, but uh, a bit braver, the females will actually, they'll wait until the, the female host bee leaves the nest 
and they'll go into the nest and lay eggs. And again, um, what happens but in this case, rather than the larvae of the host bee being eaten, the eggs will probably be eaten, or the young larvae, by the, the cuckoo bees' um, larvae. And then they, the, these bees will actually consume the uh, pollen that's been laid up by the host bee. So the host bee has done all the work, and these um, come along and take advantage of that. And there are quite, quite a lot of species in Shropshire. And you do, and they're uh, often quite difficult to tell apart. So you often have to get them into a tube or something and get a hand lens on them and, uh, to, to look at various features. Now, one day I was doing this when I was out with uh, Ian Cheeseborough, and we saw two or three of these crawling around in a mar on, a, on a cuckoo bee and thought, well, what's this? And uh, eventually it clicked with, ah, it's oil beetle um, larvae. And this is, uh, so this, this is actually taken from a, specimen we found uh, at uh, near Oswestry, Oswestry Old Hill Fort, so in the Marches area. And I think this made the first record of uh, oil beetle for some time in, 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 in the Marches area. But these have an absolutely amazing uh, life history. So I'll just note that that larvae is a be and beetle larvae, is very small um, it, with, 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 with sort of typical insect legs on it. And that's known, sorry, that's known as a triangulin larvae because it's mobile, and I'll show you the reason for that in a second. But uh, that teeny little uh, larvae eventually develops into this uh, oversized um, oil beetle uh, with this great fat abdomen. And the reason that's got a great fat abdomen is uh, that these beetles, because of their extraordinary life history, um, they lay up to 40,000 eggs in their in their in their sort of uh, throughout their their life as an adult beetle and that's probably over a, li a, a lifetime that lasts as an adult about of about two months and the female lays uh, around a thousand eggs each time she lays some eggs buries them in the ground and they hatch and when they hatch oops sorry that's coming later <laughs> but i'm going to go back to that when they hatch these teeny little larvae so this is another species. This is the, uh, let's go back, the black oil beetle. They climb to the top of the stem, usually to try and find a flower, and they hang around on tops of the flowers. And when a bee or any insect comes along, they clamber on, and in the hope that uh, some of them will get taken back to uh, a, a mining bee's nest where this usual thing happens, uh, the, the, the larvae develop, the beetle larvae develop in the nest and they basically end up consuming all of all the pollen that the host bee has laid up rather than the uh, host zone larvae. And so it's a pretty chance, sorry, it's a pretty fancy life history that, uh, and it's thought that only one in 2000 at best ever met of these larvae that are laid up only ever make it through to being an adult um, oil beetle. Now, I saw uh, this this summer in, in Shropshire on another site. This is another species, black oil beetle, rather than the violet oil beetle we found at Oswestry. Street. Um, I just wanted to show this because you can see a little midge there, and that's one of the biting midges. And uh, these have a peculiar relationship with the black oil beetles. Uh, or oil, oil beetles in general. And the reason these are called oil beetles is that they exude uh, cantharidine, which is a pretty toxic, very unpleasant, very bitter uh, chemical, which presumably um, wards off potential predators. And I think actually in this picture here, you can see that that's been damaged. And I'm just wondering whether that specimen had been attacked by a bird Instantly, the bird had tasted this uh, foul cantharidin chemical and you know, so it literally spat it out. But anyway, you saw that what's interesting is these midges actually uh, imbibe those oils. And sometimes you can find these oil beetles uh, for, uh, wandering around. They sort of wander around very, um, very slowly. Uh, and they'll have a little cloud of midges hovering over them. And these midges will be constantly landing on the beetle and trying to feed on the cantharidin. It's the most extraordinary thing to see. Um, 
I've only seen video of that, but I, I, I did manage to find this one individual midge sit, you know, sitting on and imbibing uh, this uh, camperidine chemical off the oil beetle. Right. Okay. Now, so here's what's happened to this. Is it, well, here's one of those cuckoo bees. And you can see it's absolutely covered in these triangulin larvae. So my guess is that none of these triangulin larvae were going to get anywhere. They were not going to make it through to adulthood by any means because so many of them jumped on to this bee when it had landed on a flower they were all on. But in fact, it was unable to fly. So um, they're doomed. And that bee is probably not going to be uh, doing anything along the lines of laying uh, its own eggs into the nests of mining bees, or if it's a male, it won't be mating with a female because it was more, more or less immobilized by these triangulins. It just goes to illustrate, you know, how, um, what, a, what an odd strategy, or you know, a sort of long odd strategy the oil beetles do have for getting through from the egg to uh, adulthood. Uh, now looking at uh, another bee, a beetle. I've just shoved this one uh, in, into the into the talk because it's uh, such a, a super looking thing. And here in uh, in the marches, we're right on the edge of the um, British um, sort of main centres of population for it. It's general. It's associated the bee the beetles. Uh, it's the bee beetle. It's known as. It's a lovely thing with those uh, orangey hairs across the top. And the nice sort of creamy, uh, pale, creamy and black patterning on the uh, the elytra on the abdomen. And I, I, I found this a few times in the Mortimer Forest, which is sort of st uh, straddling the Shropshire Herefordshire border near Ludlow. So that's around in the area and certainly one to keep to keep an eye out for. It's not common by any means wherever it occurs. It's uh, known throughout most of Europe, uh, uh, and it's it, it, it's pretty sc scarce. Uh, it's a widespread, but never known in any numbers from anywhere where it occurs. And there's the British distribution for it. So you can see that uh, there's a population in Scotland and another one in Wales, and we're right on the edge of it. Uh, so I, have, I haven't seen that for a few years, so hopefully it's still in the area. Uh, again, if anybody spots that, it would be great to get records of that for the Marches area. So I'm now going to look at a fly, because that's what I love looking at. Um, and these are very, very common in the spring, sort of early May time onwards. Uh, for about a month, you'll see, uh, you sometimes see clouds of these dance flies, they're known as. They're in a genus called Empis, and this is the largest of them. And what's interesting is that these um, have a very interesting sort of method of um, finding a female and convincing her that he's the guy that she needs to mate with. And in this picture here, you can see the male at the top there, female in the middle, and then that's a dead fly that the female is feeding on. And what's happened here is that the male has caught that fly and then it's uh, flown into a swarm of, the, of males of, uh, of its own species, many of which will be carrying a fly like that. And they wait for females to fly into the swarm and the female picks one of the males. And the preference goes to the males that have got a nice present for her. And uh, she's feeding away on that uh, fly whilst uh, he copulates with her. And I don't know to what extent there's a bit of a sort of safety thing in this, in that if she's occupied with that, she's not going to turn around and try to eat him. I don't think that happens, but uh, this is a sort of common thing amongst the dance flies. And there are lots of different species that all uh, do, do something similar to this. But what's amusing is that there are some related species called balloon flies. They're, uh, they're, they're also dance flies. They're in a family called Empididae, as is the previous species. And can you see in the uh, front legs here, the tarsi, uh, one of the tarsi on each leg has, has become a sort of balloon shaped thing. And that actually um, holds silk in it, which the fly uses when it catches uh, a small prey item. It actually wraps it up in silk and then presents it to the female. So it's sort of gone one step further than just giving a dead fly to the female. It actually wraps it up as a nice gift wrapped present. 
Um, even more bizarrely, sometimes some species in this genus Hilara are known to um, present an empty uh, silk. So there's nothing in it. They'll, they'll weave us a little silky um, bit of wrapping and they'll present it to a female and she'll be trying to feed away and there's nothing in there while he mates with her. And on other occasions, entomologists have um, done things like throw onto the surface of water where these uh, balloon flies will be flying because they often pick dead things off the surface of the water and they'll wrap those up. And they find that if you just chuck bits of sawdust down on the ground, they would pick those up and wrap them up and uh, give them to the females. So they're into the uh, art of conning the females that they've got a nice present for them so they can mate with them. Okay, um, don't know how we're getting on for time. I've lost track. Uh, but yes, about right. So I'm, I'm, uh, I've, I've overran, in fact. I'm just going to leave you with one of my favourite um, flies of the marches. It's a thing called the furry peat hoverfly. Uh, its um, scientific name, Syracamaya superbiums, is a really good reflection of what a super beast it is. Uh, and that's a sort of bumblebee mimic, which you'll find in damp meadows, along rides in damp woodlands, on flowers like knapweed. OK, I better finish because I think I've slightly overrun my time sorry about that Emily. okay no, thank you i think you um you finished at the right time so okay. it's okay um so we've had someone um that's had their hand up um i'm gonna go to um jean right so i'm hoping that you have a question okay this is going to work <laughs> where the technology lets us down yeah it is i think um i'm hoping that something comes up on your screen gene that will I say can i can see the hand up with a name against it on my screen mm. do you need to unmute microphones yeah i have asked to All unmute right. i'll i'll um we'll move on and see if if um Maybe she'll write it in the chat. Not sure. All oh, the hands gone down now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so someone's asked here, um, Nico. Hello. Are um, bombalis, if I've said that correctly, yeah. species host specific? I know you said. Um, the same beans, oh right? yes, yeah. Um, the common one seems to be pretty Catholic in its tastes. It, it'll. It goes as far as I know. It goes for various species in the genus. So a bit of Andrina, which is the sort of most common uh, bees that you come across. But the other one, the, the, the dotted wing bee fly, um, seems to have a preference for a bee called um, Andrina flava peas. And I think it's called the orange legged. Um, I don't know the English names for these things uh, very well, but I think it's called that's called the orange leg mining bee. And interestingly, that's a bee that spread into Shropshire probably in the last 15 years. And now the fly has followed it sort of like 12, 15 years later, uh, moving north up the country. Oh, OK. Fascinating. Um, so someone else has asked, um, is the bulberry bumble a cuckoo bumblebee, which it's not? <laughs> um, oh, no, that's right. Yeah, it yeah. does have a, And if it isn't, does it have a cuckoo species? Oh, now, I should look that up. Shouldn't I? I don't think it does, but I'm now going to quickly look in a book. Yeah. I'll, I'll look I in a book whilst answer I'm answering either. other questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go on, I'll ask another question. Go ask another question. <laughs> and I'll come um, back to that. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, um, you mentioned about um, how it's really important that we record different species that we see, especially ones that are rare. Um, how do you do that? Because I use the iRecord app, but is there another way of doing it or is that what you do? Oh, right. there's, two, there's, there's, there's two ways of going about it. Because um, I've been doing entomology and ID for uh, 40 years. I just do it with handbooks and stuff at home. But for most people, you know, they're not gonna have a microscope at home, but they might be able to get a photo. I would use iRecord where you can put a photo mm. or there's a thing called iNaturalist, okay. which actually has, um, it has an artificial intelligence element to it. So you're, you've got people contributing, you know, actual people sort of you know, giving you comments on what it might be, but also they've got this machine learning going on. So there's absolutely, I think there are millions of pictures on iNaturalist and it compares to those and gives you suggestions. Mm. So it's a really useful tool to use. 
especially for things like bumblebees, which obviously lots of people take pictures on with post and yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I do use the iRecord app um, sometimes. I ha have ID guides too. Um, yeah. But I find, obviously, because it gets logged, doesn't it? Um, yes. But I think the app's quite good. I don't know necessarily if it was about more um, or species that are harder to identify, but you like you say, your common ones, it's quite yeah. good at identifying them on the picture. Yeah. Right, we have... Emma has asked, has put her hand up. So I'm going to hope that this works now, Emma. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, which one are we looking at? What are we looking at? So I think Emma's about. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hi. Uh, I just wondered, perhaps it was a too simple a question to ask, but, but really uh, what I wanted to know was uh, for a few tips on how we can attract more insects. Um, um, to our gardens oh, to, or um... to your gardens well particularly thinking of bees obviously just lots of flowers um doesn't have to be native uh as long as as long as you've got flowers that are from families that grow natively they usually do but avoid um fancy sort of double flowered things because they don't uh, allow it. there are bees and insects that can't access the nectaries on those very easily and sometimes they don't even have a nectary um Another really good thing you can do is just uh, make little um, what's called bee hotels by drilling holes into um, bits, bits of untreated wood, so old logs and things, and leaving those in sunny positions. And you'll get, um, I think I've lost count of the number of species I get in the garden nesting, but it's a good number. You'll get perhaps a dozen different species. And you also get solitary wasps as well. Uh, so yeah, the key easy thing to do really is lots of flowers and, uh, holes for bees to nest in yeah um, okay great thank you I, I um we have quite a flower rich garden we've got lots of lavender um i think borage is really good we've sort of designated an area that's a bit more wild um which is quite nice so i think salvia is quite good as well yeah. lots of open flowers daisies um that sort of thing and um there's loads of resources on the Bug Life website as well if you wanted to have a look too. They've got um, a resource that's just for plants for pollinators too. Right. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Have you found Nigel yet? I have. Yes. Yeah. So yes, it does. In fact, it seems to be uncertain whether the Bilberry Bumblebee has a cuckoo on it, but it suggests, the book I'm looking at anyway, uh, the put says probably one of the hosts of the cuckoo bumblebee bombus sylvestris. So that's quite a common um, cuckoo bumblebee in in the marches. So it's possible that that, that does, but I don't think it's known for certain. Someone's put that in the chat as well, actually. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> somebody has got somebody who can recall this information more readily <laughs> than me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kirsty's asked, are there any main distinguishing features for identifying between wasps and bees? Um, the best way, but it's quite difficult because you basically need to be able to get a magnifier, a hand lens to, the, to them, is that uh, bees, they're, they're covered in hairs, which are sort of like little feathers. If you look at them, they've got, stra they've got branches on them. Whereas uh, wasps, the hairs are just single hairs, rather like our hairs, but much shorter. They don't, uh, they're not sort of feather-like at all. And that's, um, that's the key difference, really. So, and, and then just in general, wasps, uh, for, the, for the most part, uh, don't look very hairy. Mm. Whereas bees tend to look quite hairy. So that's quite a good, uh, that's quite, quite helpful. They have a different body shape as well, don't they? Um, ooh, they go in a little uh, bit. What? I, I think the bees probably look they look stouter because mm. they've got much more herring on on, on them. Um, but the the sort of general overall body shape is pretty similar. Uh, all the bees and wasps they have a uh, a key character they share is that is the constriction on the abdomen where it joins the thorax, and, that, and that's what sort of um, that's how you can tell bees and wasps from most other insects. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, someone said somebody's that... pointed out there very correctly. Bees are just vegetarian wasps anyway. Exactly. That's very true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
So once put, um, with so many parasites, it's amazing that any bee, egg, bees' eggs survive. Do they have a survival tactic to ensure that some eggs survive? Well, that whole business, um, laying the eggs deep in the ground, healing the cells up, uh, is all about protecting from uh, from parasites and other things that attack them. But of course, this is all, the, these behaviors have all evolved over millions of years. And at the same time, the things that attack them, they've been evolving alongside. So it's the, the people have probably heard of this arms race, and that just goes on. And that's why you get these extraordinary um, sort of life histories of things. <laughs> One, Kate, I can see you've got your hand up. <laughs> Hello, I just had a quick question. I didn't want to bust in, so I thought I'd politely wait my hand. But um, yeah, thanks, Nigel, for another really fascinating talk. And just, yeah, talking about parasites and that you illustrated in that talk that there's parasites on parasites on parasites. Yes. <laughs> uh, just goes on. Um, it's really interesting. And also that the fact that there's so much deception involved with insects as well, that they yes. pretend to wrap up a present where there is no present at all. It's yeah. really fascinating. But my one, I had a question about the hairy footed flower bee and the hairs and how he strokes the female uh, with them. Is, is there any power of selection with the female in that interaction? Can she go, oh, actually, I don't like this one. Or is it basically um, whoever gets there first? I think, well, when I've been watching them, it appears to be whatever male gets there first. Um, but I don't know for certain. But along with you know, all these things, you know, there hasn't been much study done on I mean, that thing. The um, the legs being stroked on the antenna. I actually only found that out this week, and it does seem to have only been found out very recently. I watched a clip of a film called My Garden of a Thousand Bees, which people may have watched. And this chap, during the lockdown, basically, he was a wildlife cameraman. He filmed bees in his garden and he watched the film, the males doing that stroking the antenna thing. As far as I know, that's the first time I've observed. So, uh, yeah, there's banks to discover. And, mm. uh, but my guess is, I think it's first come, first serve. But I'm not and, saying that's definite. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe therefore yeah. it's like a placate. Pla Oh, I can never say that, placatory or placatory. Yeah, difficult to know. Down. <laughs> yeah, difficult. Or just to say, yeah, I am one of your species, maybe. It's yeah. Fascinating, uh, yeah. Well, I think that, um, Emma, you've got your hand up again. Is that, the, it wasn't taken down or do you have a question? Sorry, I didn't take it down. I'll take it down now. <laughs> that's okay. I was just checking. I think that's all the questions that we have, Nigel. Unless anyone, well, there's has... one. There's one question, Emily, on um, what uh... my phone's going off. I'll just go and oh. it back down. <laughs> so uh, somebody's answered it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you've kind of answered it. Emily answered it uh, with the what trees and flowers would you recommend growing. Uh, just a, a, I suppose tree, any particular trees that oh, yeah. could be grown uh, that are good for bees. Every time, you know, for, for early mining bees. Oh, one of the things I should have said is there just isn't enough willow in the landscape. I, I, I sometimes struggle to find it. The Forestry Commission would, they seem to specialise in seeking it out and destroying it. There's never any, well, not, I not, it's not I like to say there's never any, but there's very little uh, around wider marches landscape so if anybody fancies doing something you know for, for not just for bees but all the early insects there are, are huge numbers of them are reliant on goat willow and uh, things like that so that's my that's my top tip for planting if you've got them for a, a, a flowering willow in your garden then 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 put one in ah, well thank you very much oh. nigel um i just wanted to say um we also have a few events coming up too um we've got a dingy skipper workshop that will be coming up in june i believe um there'll be more details to come um i'll probably put them in the follow-up email um and we also have a bumblebee identification day at one of our um sites which is bordering on the long mind it's really beautiful there um so you can come along and learn how to identify different bumblebees um so yeah, if anyone's interested, um, let me know. And yeah, thank you again, Nigel, for a fascinating. Okay, my webinar. pleasure.
And look at that, we finished on time. Well, two minutes over. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. <laughs>